Welcome to the CBWN Leadership Summit event, Understanding Your Power. For today's event, we have the pleasure of hearing from Caroline, uh, who will host today's sessions. session. Caroline is an author and consultant focused on leadership development and team performance. She has built and sold a successful multimedia company and was also a Hollywood publicist for some of the world's biggest and mo most beloved brands. She then went on to serve as a vice president for Forbes Book and was a CEO of the world's first talent agency for marketing thought leaders. Today, Caroline develops leaders and helps transform organizations as a senior consultant with the Oliver Group. And she also recently published her first book called Big Fish, An Entrepreneur's Guide to Success, Impact, and Legacy. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Caroline to the stage. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fabiola, and excited to be here with you all. Uh, we're going to have fun tonight. We're It's Tuesday night. We're in the trust tree together. So uh, this is going to be an interactive session. I want to bring as much value as possible, which is why I had a lot of you take that assessment ahead of time. I think most of you have done so. Um, so we'll be able to use some of your real data in this, uh, which is going to be fun. So I know sometimes like the video fatigue, but if you want to put on your videos, I really do encourage you to be as engaged and interactive as possible during our session. So Fabiola tells me that you are all a wonderful group of people. Uh, so I would like to kick things off on a positive note by talking about the pure and utter shit show that we find ourselves in today, okay? The, the general consensus of how workers feel about work uh, since the pandemic can be summed up with a number of memes, but I picked this one. 50% of people are leaving their careers, changing their careers. Employee engagement dropped for the first year in a decade in 2021. 75% of employees are reporting that burnout and mental health issues have tripled since the pandemic. In short, I mean, people are just over it. And since we're talking about women in leadership as well, it gets worse. Um, Deloitte just put out the pandemic's impact uh, on women at work, their study. And it's just shocking. 51% feel less optimistic about career prospects today. 52% have experienced some form of harassment or microaggression in the past year. 57% say they plan to leave within the next two years. These are some stats, again, pre-COVID and today. Work-life balance has plummeted from 70 to 33%. Uh, mental well-being plummeted from 68 to 33%. Physical health from 68 down to 41%. And our ability to switch things off from 63 down to 42 percent. Y'all, a quarter of women may leave the workforce altogether. I mean, that, that stat shocked me. The World Economic Forum said that the pandemic has set back gender parity efforts by a generation or more. We have got to fix this. We got to fix this to keep our current talent, to attract the rising workforce, and frankly, to re-energize these organizations for the future. And even if we're not leaders, I mean, just for, for ourselves, right? So that we can get joyful and, and successful and happy in the world of work. And certainly so that we don't see half the, a quarter of the women leaving the workforce. <clears throat> I see a lot of solutions floating around there, like, People are saying, okay, here are the steps to a happy workforce. We got to have flexible hours, um, better benefits. Let's do some sabbaticals. Maybe we can provide childcare. Let's do some skills building. And, and the thing is, on the surface, all of these things look good. But the point is that we don't really know. We don't really know what she's thinking. My guess is that it's not, man, I could really use a skills building course right now. 
All we really know is that somewhere, some needs are not getting met. And when our needs go unmet, a lot of bad things come from that. So instead of looking at these sort of blanket solutions, we need to start looking at how can we empower our people at work by meeting their fundamental needs in life. The problem is that we can't just ask them. And even ourselves, if we're a leader of self, okay, we can't just really ask ourselves, what do we need? And here's why. Harvard Business Review did a self-awareness study over the course of five years with 5,000 participants. Guess what percent of people think they are self-aware? You can just unmute yourself and shout it out. Guess what percent of people think they're self-aware? 70%. 70. Any other guesses? All of them. 90, 80%. 95% of people think they're self-aware. Now, guess what percent actually are? 50. 10%. 30. 30. 20. 15%. So we can't just ask people what they need. We can't even ask ourselves what we need because we, we lack self-awareness and worse, we think we're self-aware. So we think we, we know what those needs are, are. The thing is every human has these fundamental drives and our fundamental drives are what cause, create our needs. And then our behaviors, which are the things that show up, right? The observable behaviors that, that we show up with in the world are just an expression of trying to get those needs met. So if we can measure the first thing, if we can measure those fundamental drives, we can understand the needs and actually predict the behaviors. It's just amazing that most of us aren't measuring this. It, it, I mean, it's shocking to me actually how many leaders, how many organizations, they don't measure it. And we measure what we value so we have got to start measuring these drives, these drives that create the needs that cause the behavior. And I'll tell you, I think women in particularly have a, a real responsibility here because I truly believe that we are uniquely designed to emerge as the human-centric leaders of the future. We are more empathetic. We have higher EQ. We are more nurturing by nature. So we really are uniquely designed to be able to connect with individuals to, to get those needs met. I often liken leadership to parenting. It's like, you don't parent all kids the same way because that would be all about you, right? All about your operating style and it's my way or the highway. I mean, I guess you, you could technically parent kids that way, but at some point the kids are going to rebel. And in a lot of ways, that's what we've seen in the world of work. You know, there has been a, it's my way or the highway between employers and employees. And now the employees are rebelling. But with parenting, no, you, you meet the individual child where he or she is, and you give them the tools that they need to be successful in life. And it's the same with the world of work. Instead of offering these blanket solutions, the sabbaticals for all, back-to-back -back Zoom calls for all, we need to figure out what the individual needs of our people and ourselves really are. I mean, that is what human-centric leadership is to me. It's, it's meeting the human where they are and giving the human what they need to be able to, to succeed. So there are a lot of tools out there that measure this. Um, as somebody who has run three different businesses over the course of about 15 years and been a leader in many corporate organizations, I have both given and taken a lot of different kinds of assessments. Um, the PI is my favorite because I find it the most insightful and actionable. So that's the one that we're going to dive into today. Um, and we are going to get interactive here in a minute. I will also let you know if you have questions throughout, I will pause, but if you have questions throughout, just raise your little hand icon on the Zoom uh, and someone will, or, or just interrupt me, right? Um, 
again, we're in the trust tree together. So you, this is this is an informal session and it's yours. So the predictive index or the PI, it's been around since the 1950s. Uh, it's been administered millions of times. It's undergone 500 validity studies, many by Harvard Medical Schools that it measures what it purports to measure, that it's free from all bias. Uh, in fact, it's one of the few tools that are uh, legally accepted for a hiring tool. I'm gonna kind of give you a broad overview of what we need to know about the PI, and then we're gonna dive into <clears throat> the kind of insight that we can glean from it. Um, so first is what it measures. Uh, the PI measures our fundamental drives those fundamental drives that create the needs that then spur the behaviors. And it measures four factors to come up with these drives. One is the drive for dominance or the drive to exert one's influence on people or events. The second factor, factor B is extroversion, the drive for social interaction with other people. Please note, this is not likes and dislikes. It's not like, do I like people, do I not? It is, do I have a fundamental drive to connect socially with people or do I not? And then the third factor, patience, C, is the drive for consistency and stability. And the fourth drive, D, is the drive for formality or to conform to rules and structure. The second thing to note is the graphs. So I, anyone who has taken the assessment should have their results from PI. If for any reason you don't, uh, you can email me after and I'll make sure that you get them. But when you're looking at the, the graphs, let me show you, tell you kind of what those three patterns are that we see. The first one is the self. This is basically who you fundamentally are at your core. Uh, we call this a stable construct. So by the time you're about 18 or so, this has pretty much been developed and doesn't change much over time unless there's you know, major life event or um, you know, kind of major work in, in neuroplasticity and psycho, you know, psychotherapy and things like that. This is pretty much who you fundamentally are. The second graph we call self-concept. You know, because we're humans, we are smart and we can learn to adapt in situations. And so the self-contact is basically our adaptations that we're making based on the signals that we're receiving from our current environment. And a current environment means that this graph may be good for about six months or so and can change, again, based on the environment in which you find yourself. And then the bottom graph is, is the synthesis. It's just a mathematical combination of the first two graphs because... Um, you know, it's sort of it's sort of the you I'm going to experience. You're going to show up as some version of who you are fundamentally at your core, along with the adaptations that you're making. And then the last thing to note when we're looking at all this is the breadth of pattern. So when you look at this, basically anything to, that falls to the right of that midline, that, that midline in the red, anything that falls to the right is a higher expression of the drive. Anything that falls to the left would be a lower expression of the drive. This is also laid out in standard deviations. So if you fall within that first tick mark of the, of the midline or what we call the first sigma, this is where the majority of the population falls. You're sharing that with about 70% of people. When you get out to the second tick mark or the second sigma, you're sharing that intensity of drive with maybe 14 to 16% of the population. And if you're getting out far to the third sigmas, you're only sharing this intensity of drive with about 2% of the population. The wider the pattern, the more strongly expressed those drives are gonna be, uh, the more predictable your behaviors are gonna be and the harder they are to change. So, I yeah. I have a clarifying question. Can you just uh, define what we mean when we say drive? Like, does that mean, is it saying that in our natural state we have a tendency to, I, I guess, could you like, Double click drive, into, yeah. Sure. I mean, if you think about a, a drive, this is, this is like on the atomic level, you are driven to get this 
thing, this need met. It's what creates the needs. It's, and we're going to get into and, and go into detail of all this kind of stuff. So it's almost like you can think of it as the atomic level that creates your needs. So again, this isn't likes or dislikes. It's not saying like, oh, I'd like to connect or I don't like to connect. It's saying I am driven. I have a, a fundamental atomic level drive to connect socially with others. And that is creating need for me to interact socially with others. And if I don't get that need met, because it's not just a like or a dislike that I can take and leave, like I'm going to get that need met one way or the other, or I'm going to be extremely unhappy because there is a true drive in me that is not being fulfilled. Does that make sense? And, and we'll, we'll dive further into each of those factors. Yes. Thank you. A quick thing about that, uh, Caroline is, um, are you saying that's how you wired you're driven and you're basically wired that way? That first exactly. level. Self. Wired. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, exactly. You're wired that way. Good clarification. 